So now, let's continue our discussion with our next lesson, which is Spanish colonial and the nationalistic period of Philippine literature. So, let's start. We are going to talk about um, the literary environment and the literary forms during the period. Next, we will appreciate literary text from the period and analyze uh, one text from the literary period. Next, we will familiarize, okay, not no longer this one. Okay, we will be talking about this literary concept, elements of poetry, in our next lesson. Okay, but for this week, as I said, we will be having elements of fiction first. Now we have this, the second, uh, the, the, the next part of the essay from Christine F. Gudinez Ortega about the Philippine literature. So this is on the Spanish colonial period. So let's read it. While it is true that Spain subjugated the Philippines um, for more mundane reasons, this former European power contributed much in the shaping and recording of our literature. Religion and institutions that represented European civilization enriched the languages in the lowlands, introduced theater, which we would come to know as comedia, the sinacolo, the zarzuela, the playlets, and the drama. Spain also brought to the country, though at a much later time, liberal ideas and internationalism that influence our own Filipino intellectuals and writers for them to understand the meanings of liberty and freedom. Okay, now let's start talking about the Spanish colonial period of Philippine literature. So, as you can see, it all started when the Spanish came to the Philippines. So the first time the Spanish came, they were not successful. So uh, we, uh, the, our, our, our first national hero, our first hero, Lapu-Lapu, were able to drive out the Spanish. But the Spanish are very tenacious. They came back and during this time, I think it's 1954, they were successful. Okay? They were able to colonize, they were able to colonize the, the natives and they were able to turn what they call savages to these what they call educated individuals or civilized individuals. So what is the characteristics of the Spanish colonial period? It's in 19, 1565, pala, 1565. So what is the characteristics? It has two distinct classifications. So during this period, we have two distinct classifications. It, uh, um, it's, uh, liter uh, we, cl we have two classifications, religious literature. Okay, so you know what religious literature are and secular literature. So it introduces Spanish as a medium of communication. So yes. Most of the time, the stories that uh, most of the literary forms we will encounter are religious. Okay, they are about worshiping. They're about like um, about Christianity, but there are also some that are secular that are used for entertainment. Now let's look at the literary forms, the religious literary forms of the Spanish colonization period. So we have religious lyrics written by Ladino poets or those versed in both Spanish and Tagalog were included in early catechism and were used to teach Filipinos the Spanish language. So, and that is the main goal. You, you know, the, the, the Spaniards came in, in, in their colonies for the three Gs, God, glory, and gold. Okay, so the, the priority, um, not the priority, but one of their goal is like the G, right? The God, okay? The first G, the God. So, we they use um, the liter the, the Christian literature to teach us also their language, which is the Spanish language. So what we catechism is what we call the education Spaniards are giving us during that time. They're teaching us Christianity. So that's what we call catechism. Next, also here we have our 
first literary form, which is religious lit literary form, Passion. It is a long narrative poem about the passion and death of Christ. The most popular was Ang Mahal na Passion ni Jesu Christong Panginoon natin by Aguino de Belen. So, this is a poem. Okay? So, there are also other literary forms, but this is the most famous one, the Passion. Next one is a dramatic dramatic form. Okay? It is a religious drama. It's ang panunuluyan. Philippine Christmas dramatic ritual narrating the whole, the whole family search for a place to stay in Bethlehem for Jesus Christ's birth through song. So you are already familiar with this. It's your panunuluyan. So this is a drama that is um, performed during Christmas to narrate or to show the experience of Mary, Joseph, just to uh, give birth to baby Jesus. Next, we have Sinacolo, dramatization of the passion. Hmm? It shows the passion and death of Christ. We have Salubong, dramatizes the reunion of the risen Christ and his mother. So it happens every um, Sunday. Uh, how do you call this? Uh, oh, oh. Okay, it is performed during Easter Sunday. So ang Salubong, okay? Uh, you know, uh, yeah. Okay, next we have Tibag. It's a dramatic performance for the purpose of manifesting devotion for the Holy Cross of Santa Elena and King Constantine as they search for the pieces of the Holy Cross. So that's Tibag. And we have your Moro Moro. This is performed during town fiestas to entertain the people and to remind them of their Christian religion by showing the battle between Muslims and Christians. As you can observe, guys, each part of Jesus Christ is performed in a drama, okay, in the, in the, in the literary forms you have here. So, Panunuluyan is, you know, the birth of Christ. Sinakulo is the crucifixion of Christ. Salubong is the rise, uh, the, the, the risen Christ. And Tibag is, you know, this is not the life of Jesus, but it shows uh, faith and Christianity, okay, on, on the search for the missing, the missing parts of the Holy Cross. And then, Moro Moro naman is, you know, it's about Christian living also, how how Christian during the time fight against the Muslim because they believe that their their religion is the correct one. So it's about Christianity. But most of these forms are in in, in drama, in dramatic, dramatic form. Next we have your that's your religious that's your religious literature. Now we have your secular non-religious literary forms. So we have your musical, secular, non-religious literary forms. So we have fear, for fears. <laughs> yeah, first, your awit is in the decasyllabic verse. So, nandito na naman yung term natin, which are fabricated stories right, uh, from writers' imagination, although the setting and characters are European. Colorful, tale, colorful tales of chivalry made for singing and chanting. So as you can see, the we inherited uh, the 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 characteristics of our pre-Spanish literature, the rhythmic and the melodic characteristics here in the singing and chanting of the awit. Then we have your corrido, a metrical tale written in octosyllabic quatrains. So we will have examples later. We have dung ao, the dung ao. This is a chant in free verse by a bereaved person or his representative beside the curbs of the dead. So we can say that Dung Ao could, is a form of Filipino elegy, right? This is a chant in free verse by a bereaved person or his representative beside, because this is a poem for the dead. So we can say that this is a Filipino elegy, the Dung Ao. So what we have here is an example of an awit, okay? By, which is Florante at Laura by Francisco Balagtas, Baltazar. So if you can say it's dodecasyllabic, which means it's 12 syllables in each line. So let's see if each line is really 12 syllables. Okay. Kung pag sa ulang kong pasahin sa isip. Okay, it's 12. Ang nangakara ang araw ng pag-ibig. It's 12. May maha hagilap kayang nati titi 12. Liban na kay siliang na mugad sa dip dip. It's 12. 
So that's what that's why we call awit to decasyllabic verse because each line is 12 syllables. Now we have an example of your corrido, which is your f very common and very famous, very classic Ibong Adarna by Jose de la Cruz. Now let's count if it's really octasyl octosyllabic, which eight syllable. Okay, each syllable in each line. So birhing inang marikit seven. Imperadora sa langit eight. Tulungan po yaring isip eight. Matutung makapag sulit eight. Sa awa mo po talaga eight. So it's Okay, wait a minute. It's eight. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's eight syllables. Even though the first one is not eight syllable, um, the other one, the other three are eight syllable each. So that's still considered octosyllabic. Octosyllabic. But as you can see, it quatrains. I think this is my mistake. I think I I I included the next line, which is not shouldn't be included because when you say quad trains only four lines so let me remove that one okay okay because you know we have the period here you know we have the period so it means that's the end of the quad train so this is my mistake let's not include that one so this okay this is an octosyllabic quad train okay octosyllabic eight lines i uh, eat eight syllables in each line and then quad trains four lines okay four lines each stanza so this is your musical secular non-religious literature we have next one your poetic joust secular non-religious uh, secular literature so what are poetic jousts so these are battles okay poetic battles of wit okay so we have your karagatan first type okay first poetic joust that that um uh, surfaced is their karagatan. This is a poetic joust. Uh, this is a poetic vehicle of a social religious nature celebrated during the death of a person. Okay, take note of their characteristic. Karagatan is performed during the death of a person, but it's a battle. Okay, social religious uh, of social religious nature. That's your karagatan. Next, we have another poetic joust that surfaced. Duplo. The duplo replaced the karagatan. This is a poetic joke in speaking and reasoning. So duplo is no longer limited in in lamay, okay, in wakes, okay. Um, it it extended its influence outside the lamay. So it's no longer um um perf uh, 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 it's no longer performed. It's no longer held during lamays, but also in other um gathering so that's your duplo next an, imp an improvement of your karagatan and lastly our the the most famous form of poetic joes in the philippines is your balagtasan so the balagtasan this is a poetic joes or a contest of skills in debate on a particular topic or issue so the balagtasan became a more formalized form of poetic joes in the philippines so i think in your lifetime or in your high school, you were also able to perform a balagtasan, okay? So before, a balagtasan is not a, 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 prepared, a prepared battle. Balagtasan is really um, a debate, okay? It's really a debate on a topic or an issue that will require this, the poetic skills of people, not only their poetic artistic skill, but their knowledge, okay? Their, their, their way of reasoning. So... You know, it's really interesting to to see how, how these literary form uh, showcases ha, the the knowledge. Okay, showcases the wits of the Filipinos even during this era when our colonizers think that we are not really capable of of this kind of knowledge of this kind of reasoning. So this is an evidence of how how um, witty or how uh, smart Filipinos are because of our balagtasan and your, your poetic jousts. Now, we have your literary forms. So another form is your dramatic. So dramatic literature, non-religious literature, is very famous during this time. 
Okay, Th these are the like drama. I don't know. I, I haven't researched about the reason, but drama is very famous during this time of of the Philippine literature. Maybe because Filipinos doesn't have any form of entertainment, and they can only have their entertainment through dramas. Okay, different types of dramas. Now let's see what are the different types of drama in the Philippine uh, during the Spanish colonization. We have Zerzuela. It is a lyric dramatic genre that alternates between spoken and sung scenes, the later incorporating operatic and popular songs as well as dances. So this is a drama which is a sing and dance drama. So melodrama. Okay, Zerzuela. We have Lagaylay, a special occasion for the Piliareños of Sursugon during May time to get together. So May time is the time of harvest also. So during the time of harvest, they, you know, they perform dramatic performances, which is called Lagaylays. Carilio, a form of dramatic entertainment performed on a moonless night, specific, very specific characteristic on a moonless night during a town fiesta or dark nights after a harvest. Bakit kaya kailangan moonless talaga at kailangan dark? Okay, so that's your carillo. Next is your sainete, a short musical comedy popular during the 18th century. So that's the 1700s. They were exaggerated comedy shown between acts, plays, and were mostly performed by characters from the lower class. So that's your sainete, a musical comedy. Okay, next we have your... Um, lit prose narrative, secular non-religious literary natin, your process, we have written to, uh, written to prescribe proper decorum. So it's like, uh, it's your oral literature, it's your essay, uh, it's your sawikain and salawikain, but in, in, a, in, in this form, okay? In, in essay form, in, in prose narrative form, in essay form, not in, not in verse or poetic form. No. Not in, yeah. In, in prose form na. Ang ating mga sawikain. Written to describe proper decorum. The way of teaching. We have dialogo, ejemplo, manual de urbanidad, and tratado, or treaties. So, we also have these examples of prose literature, prose narrative literature during the time. We have the Modesto de Castro's Pagsusulatan ng Dalawang Binipini na si Urbana at si Feliza. Okay, if you can remember, this is a type of um, epistolary, a story that is made from exchange of letters. And then we have Joaquin Poisson's Ang Bagong Robinson. Okay, the new Robinson. It is an adaptation of uh, The Adventures of Rob Robinson Crusoe. If you know that's, uh, that that American novel. So that ends your Spanish uh, period. Now we are going to talk about the next period, which is still a continuation of the period. The period of enlightenment, we also call it the period of revolution. We also call it the period of nationalism. Okay, so different periods, different names, but same period. So what is the characteristic of this period? It planted seeds of nationalism in Filipinos. Language shifted from Spanish to Tagalog. It addressed the masses instead of the intelligentsia. So uh, it doesn't only address the elites, but also the lower classes and the common people. So literature now expanded to a more broad, um, a more broad, um, um, a broader, more broad, so a broader audience. So we have your literary forms in the propaganda literature. Um, we have your propaganda. Uh, so we have two literary forms actually in your in your nationalistic period. We have the liber revolutionary literature and you have your propaganda literature. For your propaganda literature, their goal is a reformatory in objective. They don't want they don't want to 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 drive the Spanish away. These forms of literature doesn't is it, their goal is not to drive the Spanish away, but to to um, appease the Spanish or to to ch just change something in the system, but not 
totally to drive the Spanish away. So we have your political essays. Sample, we have your political essays like satires, editorials, news articles. So to attack and expose the evils of Spanish rule. Okay. So just to expose the, the evilness of their rule, okay, but not really to to overhaul the Spanish government. So examples natin is the Diaryong Tagalog, founded by Marcelo del Pilar, and La Solidaridad, whose editor-in-chief is Cristiano Lopez Jaina, and also where, where Rizal is also a part of political novels like No Limitangere and El Filipusterismo. So these are the common political novels that we have during that time. So these are all written by Jose Rizal, okay? masterpieces of Jose Rizal. That even though the, these are only propaganda literature, they, be, they paved way for the revolution because, you know, um, Bonifacio read, Bonifacio read the uh, the, the books, okay? And then Bonifacio interpreted the books in his own way. And then he thinks that I am, okay, based on my own understanding, like he thinks that it it's what the, he and Rizal have the same goal to overthrow Spanish colonial rule. But Rizal's goal is not that. Rizal doesn't want to drive the Spanish away. He wants Spaniards to see Philippines as, as the same. Okay, the same as them. Okay, he wants the Spanish to consider the Philippines as a province, not a colony. So, yeah, because of a very different interpretation of the text, the revolution uh, um, came to life. Yeah. Next, we have your revolutionary literature. So propaganda literature, we have your more propagandistic than literary as it is more violent in nature and demanded complete independence for the country. So it's not really more, more it's more propagandistic, more more of a propaganda, okay? More more than a propaganda like that because it's, it seeks for um, independence, okay? Not for change, but for independence talaga. So we have your political essays. Kanina, we have your political essays then. So we have more, more political essays here. Help inflame the spirit of revolution. So examples natin ay the, the essays in Kalayaan, a newspaper of the society edited by Emilio Jacinto. We have your parody. Um, uh, a parody is a work that's created by imitating an existing original work in order to make fun of or comment on an aspect of the original so these are yeah parodies are, are more like caricatures or more like exaggerations of of the reality to attack to attack that the, the topic okay exaggerations of the topic to attack the topic so examples are fry butud by graciano lopez Haina and the salan at Tuxuhan by marcelo h del pilar Next, we have your poetry. So, poetry will not be lost in our literary forms. We have the True Decalogue by Apolinario Mabini. Samples natin, True Decalogue by Apolinario Mabini. And we have Katapusang Hibik ng Pilipinas by Andas Punifasio. And Liwanag at Dilim by Emilio Jacinto. Okay, so these are the poetic samples during that time. What are the notable works in the era? So, not... What I mean with this era is the the era, the Spanish colonial rule, and also this 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 era, the revolutionary period. So let's start with the first notable work of the era, which is the Doctrina Christiana by Father Fray Juan, uh, by Father Fray Doble Doble na, by Father Juan de Placencia. So this is the first printed book in the Philippines, printed in 1593. So this contains like rules and teachings in the uh, Christian belief, okay, in the Christian faith. So this contains the Lord's Prayer, uh, um, the Hail Mary, and and yeah, those those uh, 
those texts, those prose. Then we have your, the second printed book in the Philippines, which is Nuestra Señora del Rosario by Father, Father Blancas de San Jose, printed in 1602. So this is the second book and it's about the life. It's, it's a book about the life of the saints. I can still remember that I think my, my Lola, which is, which is a mananabtan, in, in the Catholic faith, ha have this book. I used to look at the, very, at the very ancient book she has. I don't know if it's a hundred years old, but she has this, this, this kind of book. So next we have the Librong Pag-aaralan ng mga Tagalog ng Wikang Castila by Tomas Pintin. So published uh, 1610. So this is, this is very, in, this is a very interesting literature because this is the first grammar book written by a Filipino. There are there are other grammar books before, but they are not written by Filipino and they are not written in Filipino. This grammar book primarily, this Spanish grammar book is written by a Filipino and is written in Filipino. That's why it's very, um, it's very significant by Tomas Pinpin. Okay. Next we have passion. So yung Ginami natin na pasyon, yung, yung poem talaga ng pasyon. It's written by Gaspar Aquino de Belen. Aquino yung kanina, pero Aquino de Belen pala. Written in 1703 and approved in 1704. Okay? So this is, the, the full title is, Mahal na Pasyon ni Yesu Cristo, ang Panginoon natin, na tula. Okay? Ibang spelling nila ng tula dati. That's what we call your vow chain. Okay. We have Urbana at Felizani, Father Modesto, Padre Modesto de Castro, written in 1864, a collection of fictional letters. So these, these are not yet considered a novel, even though it's a long, it's a long prose, but is not yet considered a novel. Kasi it's serialized. When you say serialized, pa unti unti na napa publish. Okay, so it's not yet it's not yet considered a novel. So a collection of letters that is now uh, that, that 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 narrates a story now. But okay, that's it. Next we have the first collection of poetry, Sampagita y otras poesas by Pedro Paterno Varias. Okay, so he is a Filipino, but he published in Madrid. Okay, so this is this is significant because this is the first collection of poetry published by a Filipino even though it's not published in the Philippines but later on it was there, there were there were publishings in the Philippines also of this of this particular literature then we have Ninay the first novel in the Philippines I haven't read this but Project Gothenburg has a PDF maybe I'll be reading that 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 story that this novel someday Mm, okay, this is the first novel in the Philippines written by the same author, um, Pedro Paterno. This is still published in Madrid, but this is significant because this is the first ever novel published by a Filip Filipino. But even though it's not published in the Philippines, it's published by a Filipino, Pedro Paterno. Published and written by a Filipino. Then let's look at the... Um, text we are going to appreciate in in this era so so in the spanish era and in the revolutionary era we will only you will only be reading the the parodies of marcelo h del pilar which is titled the salad at so we only have one um we only have one one uh, text to 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 appreciate because Arami kasi subtext niya, okay? It's it's written under one title, but they, we have a lot of texts here. So we have the Sala na Tukso, Nantanda ng Kara Cruz, a parody of the sign of the cross, parody of the act of contrition, parody ng Our Father, parody ng Hail Mary. Okay, so you read this book, uh, you, you read this these texts, you read these parodies, and then try to understand it, try to um, get used to the differences in, in the orthography, in the writing, you know, there are different spellings. So at least malaman yung, okay, hindi pala ganito ang spelling ng ganitong word dati. So be, 
um, be exposed with the literature lang, basa basahin, and then try to answer this question. Do you think this work is blasphemous? Why or why not? Okay, so these are holy texts. And then look what Marcelo H. Del Pilar did to the text. Okay, so in your own standpoint, in your point of view, do you think these works are blasphemous? When you say blasphemous, it's an act of, uh, 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 it's an act of uh, rebellion against God. Or, uh, yeah, you're, it's like you're rebelling against God. So do you think this is a rebellion against God or a, bla a blasphemy? If you think so, why? If you don't think so, why not? So after you read that literary text, we will have these texts. Okay? These are the texts that you, these are some of the texts you can choose from for your analysis. Okay, so Cristiano Lopez Hainas Friar Butod and Andres Bonifacio Talum, uh, Talumpati ni Gat Andres Bonifacio sa gini ng pagkakatag ng KKK na mga anak ng bayan, Hunyo 7, 1892. Okay guys, so we have four literary texts for analysis, di ba? So first we have Aliguyon, then we have, um, we have uh, Hinila Wood, and then we have here Friar Butod, and we have here Talumpati ni Gat Andres Bonifacio. So, you only choose one, okay guys, you only choose one from the four literary texts to analyze. So, if you want to choose Hinila Wood, or if you want to choose, um, uh, okay, you just analyze Hinila Wood, okay? Or, if you want to choose Friar Butod, just analyze Friar Butod, okay? But there are merits, Okay, kasi hindi, hindi the same ang length nila. Okay, so longer text will have, will, the, the lowest score, if you will analyze the long texts in our uh, analysis, uh, text to, for analysis, if you analyze the long text, the lowest score you can get is if, uh, no, 16. That's the lowest score you can get. But if you analyze the, 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 shorter text the lowest score you can get is 10 okay that's the lowest score you can get okay kung hindi maganda ang analysis mo that's the lowest lowest score you can get so if you want to to aim for higher uh, higher scores okay um choose the longer text to analyze but it's up to you halimbawa yung short text ang pinili mo pero ang galing-galing mo naman ang galing-galing pala ng analysis mo so pwede ka pa ring mag-perfect Pero kung hindi magaling ang analysis mo, so sa 10 ka babagsak, hindi talaga magaling siya. Okay? So, yun. Just choose one text to analyze out from the four uh, texts for analysis we have here. And that ends our lesson on um, the Spanish and the Revolutionary Period. So, the Spanish colonial period literary environment is mostly centered on religious works and Spanish is a medium of writing. The Spanish colonial period literary forms are divided into religious and secular types, and there is a lively existence of plays and poetry also. The nationalistic period or the revolutionary period started the use of the native Tagalog language in literary pieces. The nationalistic period awakened the heart of the Filipinos and the literary forms during the nationalistic period shifted from religious to reformatory and revolutionary. Okay, so there's a difference between reformatory and revolutionary in the nationalistic period. So next lesson, we will be talking about the American, Japanese, and the modern period of Philippine literature. So that's a very long discussion. So for now, goodbye.